You might be surprised to hear that I won't claim that a resurrection of the dead cannot have ever occurred or can never occur in the future. If a God does exist and decided to raise anyone from the dead, it seems logical to think that this could take place, especially if the God in question was able to simply speak matter into existence and create an entire universe from scratch in less than 144 hours. But then if a God did intervene in the natural workings of the universe and alter the rules of physics, it would then be classified as a miracle and arguably the least likely thing to occur, but not impossible. However, this would entail the existence of a God and in the case of Jesus' resurrection, not just any God. It would mean the existence of one particular God, the God of the Bible. And as far as I can tell, this is itself a most improbable thing. Renowned biblical scholar Bart Ehrman argues that based upon the New Testament, we simply cannot know or even be remotely confident that the resurrection of Jesus was in fact a historical event. Ehrman says that the evidence we do have is unreliable and hearsay at best. But unlike Ehrman, I will argue not only that there is no good evidence to support the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus, but that given what we now know about the New Testament, Christian origins, and science, there is actually strong evidence against the resurrection of Jesus. Short of loud trumpets, descending angels, and a flaming sword of judgment, or maybe a time machine, our examination of the resurrection of Jesus will always remain incomplete and will ultimately end in some kind of vague probability between one and zero. Somewhere between zero, impossible, and one, it happened. I won't actually provide a number because I don't think it's possible to assess the probability for this alleged event. A historical event in antiquity can never be proven or disproven like a math theorem, but it might be possible to make an overwhelming case for or against an event to the point that there are no reasonable doubts as to the conclusion drawn from the available evidence. This is where I intend to go. I will attempt to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the resurrection of Jesus did not occur. Our first stop is a fairly thorough look at the idea that an account of the post-resurrection appearances by Jesus was never part of the original gospel story. I'll use the traditional authorship when referring to the gospels as a matter of convenience in this video series, even though the gospels were written anonymously. Most scholars believe that Mark is the earliest of the four canonical Gospels. Why this is so is beyond the scope of this video series, but many scholars also believe, as I do, that the original story of the escapades of Jesus in Palestine, the Gospel of Mark, never contained any post-resurrection details as found in the majority of later Gospel manuscripts. What evidence could we lay on the proverbial table that would support the claim that the last 12 verses were never part of the original Gospel of Mark? This is Codex Sinaiticus, a 4th century Bible and the earliest complete Bible in existence. If we look at the 16th chapter of Mark, we notice something very strange. It ends at verse 8. Verses 9 through 20, as found in the King James translation and many other translations, are missing from this copy of Mark. This is Codex Vaticanus, another 4th century Bible. If we locate the last chapter of Mark in this Codex, we also run into the same problem. Verses 9 through 20 the ones that show Jesus appearing to the women and disciples and giving the Great Commission and making promises about drinking poison with no ill effects are all missing from this early Bible. Another manuscript, Minuscule 304, a 12th century manuscript containing Mark, 
also ends at verse 8. The late 4th century Codex Syriac Sinaiticus also ends at verse 8. The two oldest Georgian manuscripts, circa 7th century, end at verse 8 as well. The old Latin Codex, Babiensis, is also missing verses 9 through 20. One Sahidic manuscript ends at verse 8 as well, as do about a hundred Armenian copies. The church father Origen, who lived in the early 3rd century, quotes from the post-resurrection accounts of Matthew, Luke, and John, but not from Mark, or any of the other endings to Mark. Eusebius, considered to be the church historian, living in the 4th century, writes in a reply to a question regarding a difference between the longer ending of Mark and the account in Matthew that a possible solution to the discrepancy is to realize that almost all the copies of Mark known to him were missing verses 9 through 20, and that if one counts this ending as spurious, the discrepancy between the two Gospels is solved. Quoting Eusebius, For the one who sets aside the passage itself, verses 9 through 20, the pericope that says this might say that it is not extant in all the copies of the gospel according to Mark. The accurate ones of the copies, at least, circumscribe the end of the history according to Mark in the words of the young man seen by the women who said to them, Do not fear, you seek Jesus the Nazarene, and those that follow to which it further says, And having heard, they fled, and said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. For in this manner, the ending of the Gospel according to Mark is circumscribed almost in all the copies. Jerome, another church father and the creator of the Latin version of the Bible, the Vulgate, also attests to the fact that almost all of the copies of Mark he had seen did not contain verses 9 through 20. Quoting Jerome, of which question the solution is twofold. For either we do not receive the testimony of Mark, which is extant in rare gospels, almost all of the Greek books not having this chapter at the end, especially since it looks like it narrates things diverse from and contrary to certain evangelists. An interesting fact is that more of the copies of Mark that were circulating in the western regions of the Mediterranean had the longer ending, while most of those circulating in the eastern regions did not. This makes perfect sense and is quite analogous to species of animals becoming varied by means of geographical separation, and in this case, the geographical separation was the Mediterranean Sea. Once several copies of Mark gained the long ending, they would have begun to multiply in the region that gave birth to the long ending, while the other region remained relatively similar to the original version, but as more time passed, the longer ending became favored once it crossed the sea, but it would take many centuries before that happened, as evidenced by the testimonies of Eusebius and Jerome. Several copies of Mark that do have the longer ending are denoted with either an asterisk or other notation which normally meant that the verses in question were in debate or questionable at the time the manuscript copy was made. In other words, the copyist had at least one copy of Mark without the verses and one with. What's a copyist to do? It's obvious. Use the longer ending and denote the discrepancy with an asterisk or other symbol. The New Living Translation even states in a footnote that the earliest copies of Mark do not contain anything beyond chapter 16, verse 8. The most reliable early manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark end at verse 8. Other manuscripts include various endings to the Gospel. A few include both the shorter ending and the longer ending. The majority of manuscripts include the longer ending immediately after verse 8. 